so I'll talk about a, a uh, you know, the, the problem of, well, you know, equiangular lines, okay? So we know this problem by many different names. Uh, the name that I chose almost at random for the title was, uh, was, was tight two designs in complex projective spaces. So maybe just to start off with some math, um, suppose we take complex projective space um, where, we, where I take d-dimensional complex vectors and then mod out by the length. Okay, so this is, you know, you can identify points in this space with lines in d-complex dimensions. And so this, this space is, um, we can look at it as an association scheme. I mean, if everybody's mentioning these today, I might as well mention it here too. We have this nice filtered algebra of polynomial functions filtered by degree t that are given by this expression, say right here, um, this, this Paul sub t. And so let me just explain some notation here. So this z, by this I mean like a, a vector of coordinates on a d-dimensional complex vector space. And this z bar, you should think of them as some kind of some copies of the same coordinates, which uh, the bar you should think of as complex conjugation, but I really want to have this be with, uh, with 2D independent variables uh, throughout the discussion. So this CZ sub T, I just mean the homogeneous degree T polynomials in these D variables and uh, same for the conjugates. Okay, so this, so this Paul T is what you get if you take these homogeneous polynomials that are degree T in the Zs and degree T in the Z bars and um, evaluate them on the unit sphere or if you like kind of mod out by the length. So you'll notice that, that these things here, they're, they're homogeneous in the sense that if I, if I re, so I'm like dividing by something that scales the same way that the numerator is scaling by. So um, it, it doesn't care about the length of the vector that you put in, right? So if I take some vector V, I plug in, let's say V to the first coordinate and the complex conjugates of V into the second ones. If I scale this by some number, I'll get the same function. Okay, so these are defining bona fide functions on a projective space. And if I take the union over all t, I get basically the algebra of all functions, or at least a dense you know, subspace, depending on what functions you want to consider. But we'll just kind of take the polynomial functions for this discussion. And uh, it turns out that this space can be decomposed into a disjoint, uh, <clears throat> sorry, into a, into a direct sum of subspaces of what are known as harmonic polynomial functions, or I should say harmonic polynomials, which restrict to harmonic polynomial functions, um, given by this expression here. So basically, it's just you take this Paul T and you take everything that's in the kernel of this Laplacian operator, which I've written right here. So you're just taking the derivatives with respect to the, the Zs and the Z bars. Okay, so that, so in each one of these Paul spaces, there's going to basically be some highest degree space that you keep. And as you increase t, you get a new space of functions and so on uh, to infinity. So, okay, so let's start with the definition. Given some set of unit vectors, um, I'll say that, you know, that they form a t design or more specifically the points in the projective space that they define forms a t design if um, basically, um, if these vectors are, are, are zeros of, for all the harmonic uh, polynomial functions leading up to degree t, okay. So, oh wait. so how small can a two design be? Well, there's a linear programming bound. And uh, for two designs, this just tells us that, uh, you know, you have a lower bound, which is in terms of the dimension of the space of degree one polynomial function, which in this case happens to be d squared. Okay, um, there's a, a two design meeting this bound, um, therefore has the minimal possible cardinality, right? Because you're achieving it. And in such a case, it's known as tight. Um, so people talk about you know, tight complex projective or, or just tight projective T designs, or just tight T designs in general are ones that, 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 that match this type of a linear programming bound. And so it's not hard to show, and in some, maybe in some sense, part of the definition, maybe even, that such T designs are also one distance sets, which is to say that if I'm measuring the distance in terms of the angle between two lines, like the, the minimal angle. Um, and so these actually correspond to some set of complex equiangular lines, okay? Um, maybe just to throw out some, some stuff here. So this can all be generalized to higher T, and it can be generalized to many other spaces. 
and pretty much everything I've said holds with some small modifications for all the different crosses, or the, the compact rank one symmetric spaces. These are all some nice association schemes. Um, okay. So, so complex equiangular lines um, is sort of a dual notion to two design. And um, so what's going on there? So maybe we take a step back and just say I give you N vectors in D dimensions. And let's say that they're unit vectors. So the inner product squared is one. Uh, and this is the Hermitian inner product. So I'm conjugating one of the entries. And let's say that it equals some constant if they're not the same. Okay, so it, it's very easy to prove. I mean, this is also an LP bound, but I can just prove for you directly without invoking any machinery. Um, you can show that this that, that N has to be at most D squared. And basically maybe you read my proof here while I was rambling. It's just, you'd make the rank one projectors onto these vectors. Then now you take those projectors, consider those to be vectors in a vector space of matrices. And then you take the inner product between those, you get some, you know, some N by N gram matrix. And um, <clears throat> it turns out that the entries of that are the, are the, are the absolute value squares of these overlaps. And if you plug them into this matrix, you can just calculate the determinant and you find that it has to be uh, positive in like the non-trivial cases. So this implies that these projections are linearly independent. They can be at most D squared of them. And it's basically the exact same proof as the LP bound. Um, so if you achieve this bound, it's also not hard to show that this overlap alpha has to be exactly one over D plus one. And so, okay, so we've, we, we had this other bound that was D squared, we had this bound that was D squared, and maybe I'll just name this conjecture the Zahner conjecture, because maybe he's the first one that ever really came out and said this out loud, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, con he conjectured that this bound is achieved for all D in complex projective spaces. And I'll say a bit later about why that should be surprising. But before that, I'll just kind of outline a bunch of different equivalent formulations of this problem, which are all closely related in some sense. So we've seen you know, uh, uh, these, you would get these maximal sets of equiangular lines. Um, just by changing some definitions a little bit, we get maximal sets of equidistant points where you measure the distance by, um, let's say, if you consider CPD minus one as a Riemannian manifold, right? There's a nice Riemannian metric on it given by the Fabini study metric. And if you take the geodesic distance, according to that, that's exactly related to this, to this overlap of the vectors and also to like the angle between the lines. And so you'd get a maximal set of equidistant points if, if those things exist, also known as maximal equiangular tight frames. Um, here the word tight in this phrase corresponds to kind of t equal one, not t equal two. Like in other words, if you take the projections onto these lines that they should average out to something proportional to the identity. Um, they also wind up being minimal two designs as you know, coming back to my first slide. Um, Another way to look at it is just this is a you're embedding kind of a metric simplex into the uh, um, into the space of density matrices, or I should say into the space of pure states of a quantum system. There's also a formulation in terms of uh, you get an isometric embedding of Banach spaces of L2D into L4 of D squared. Um, I won't describe how that works, but it's kind of straightforward. Um, also, and I put this one in red. I tried to put conjectures in red. I, I tried to use orange, but it didn't look too nice against my slides. Um, but I conjectured that these are actually maximal volume simplices embedded into the convex set of density matrices. And I had some numerics uh, that, that verified that. I worked with an undergrad student years ago who checked this numerically up to some reasonable dimension. And uh, finally, this word sick POVMs. I'll say a bit about what that is. So it stands for symmetric informationally complete positive operator valued measure. And uh, basically it's just, you take the projections onto those vectors and you rescale them a little bit so that they sum up to exactly the identity. And um, just you know, physically what they correspond to is a certain kind of measurement of a D-dimensional quantum system that's optimal in a, in a certain well-defined way. And the word informationally complete just means that these projections span the whole space. So if I take, an operator and I write it out in the basis of, 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 of these rank one projections, I can reconstruct it. And in particular, you can learn those coefficients by doing a measurement, which is kind of what this thing in the bottom here means. But, um, okay, so 
Okay, so <clears throat> maybe another way to write what I mean by two designs in this language of quantum states um, is, is to write it like this. So this is kind of just redefining stuff from the earlier slide in a much more in, in a much more readable way, at least for people. Well, I know at least six of Chris's students in, in this room took my course in quantum. So sorry if I assume everybody took it. Um, but regardless, the upshot is this. So you take these projections onto the vectors. And if you take the tensor product of those, of those projections with themselves and average over the set, that this thing should be proportional to the projection onto the subspace of symmetric vectors, that is vectors of you know, CD, tensor CD that, um, that are invariant under swapping the two, uh, uh, the two tensor factors. Okay. There's a symmetric subspace and an anti-symmetric subspace. And so basically you should see nothing on the anti-symmetric subspace. And if you could find a set of such vectors that, that, that are of projections that are rank one that satisfy this, that's the same thing as finding a two design. Okay, so these six PLVMs are, you know, they're, they're maximal sets of equiangular lines, they're minimal complex projective two designs, they're tight two designs and so on. Okay, so that's a lot of theory with no examples. So, or pictures for that matter. So here's a nice picture and an example. So in dimension two, this is the lowest example where it's interesting. Um, you have this nice set of four points, which are just basically the corners of this four sided die. Okay, and you can imagine if I embed this into a sphere, or like, so this, this sphere that are the two, you know, the two sphere is actually the set of, you know, this is, you can identify points on this with, uh, with CP1, okay, with complex projective line. And you, if you take like this, or it should be over, I realize I'm using my cursor on probably the wrong one, I'm using here. So if you, if you put one here, one here, one here, and then one in the back, you get a tetrahedron inscribed into the sphere. And um, there's a really nice way to write out the rank one projections onto these four vectors. And uh, it's basically like this. So, so, so you just take the, the three Pauli matrices, Pauli X, Pauli Y, and Pauli Z. These things are a basis for the traceless Hermitian matrices, the two by two traceless Hermitians. And you can check if you like that this thing here is a rank one projection that corresponds to say one of these corners. Okay, so there's, so there's two possibilities here, essentially. You have like, there's two ways of putting this, uh, you know, this tetrahedron into the ball. And so the thing that you should notice about this is that these configurations are actually, at least in this example, they're an orbit of, um, you know, of the group Z2 cross Z2 acting by these Pauli matrices by conjugation. So in other words, if I take, you know, if I take X and Z, these things don't quite commute, but they almost do up to a scalar factor. So if I take the group that they generate and mod out by the center, I get Z2 cross Z2. Okay, so it's just, you know, did an X happen, did a Z happen? So it looks kind of like a finite vector space. Um, and if you take the orbit under this group of any one of the corners of this cube, you get a sick PLVM dimension two. Okay, um, so that's a nice example. I'll say one other interesting thing that happens here, which is that this corner here has a nice symmetry that is also shared with this entire group generated by X and Z. Namely, if I take the group generated by X and Z and I look at the normalizer in the group of projective unitaries, this gives me the octahedral group, which is isomorphic to this group right here, which acts projectively, okay? And the neat thing is that there's an order three subgroup of this group and it fixes this corner. And maybe it wouldn't seem neat now, but maybe what's incredibly shocking is that that order three symmetry seems to persist for all D. And it's kind of the key to, uh, it should be the key to, well, it's the key to unlocking the secrets of whatever we need to discover in this problem. I'll leave it at that. So to compare, maybe we look at the case of real equiangular lines. Okay, so, so over the real numbers, there's an analogous bound, which instead of being D squared, winds up being uh, D squared plus D over two. It's the dimension of the space of symmetric D by D matrices instead of the Hermitian D by D matrices. And this bound is rarely tight. So, we know that if it's tight, 
then alpha has to be of this form when d is greater than or equal to four. And if we kind of list out, you know, the bound versus, um, you know, what we would like to find, we find that like, like we know the answer for some small numbers and it's just not always met, right? So, so maybe in dimension four, you'd like 10, there's only six, you'd like 15 and dimension five, but there's only 10. Um, I might've heard that this dimension 14 was resolved in the case, somebody maybe showed this was 28, but perhaps somebody in this audience would know the yeah. answer. Yeah, it was, I, I think that this one was recently resolved. Yeah. Okay. I, and I think, I thought it was 29 actually. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't want to say like I could be wrong, but this was resolved and like a few other cases were resolved. There's a codex talk on it. It's like, okay. One of the most I think I saw codex. the abstract, but I didn't catch it. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's good. Somehow it's good that this is 28 uh, for numerological reasons, I guess, but we'll leave it at that. Um, you know, going higher and higher, we have like, you know, there's some, when is it met? Well, it's met in like, you know, in, uh, in all these dimensions here, it winds up coming from the E7 lattice. There's some representation, a 56 dimensional representation of the, e, of the E7 lattice whose roots I think give this to you. And also um, the, the leech lattice, like the minimal vectors in the leech lattice wind up giving you the optimal one over here. So, or something closely related to that. I'm not sure exactly, don't quote me. But um, the nice thing about these is that we have explicit constructions because they correspond to strongly regular graphs. Okay, so what's happening in other cases? Well, in the complex case, it's kind of a, a breakthrough kind of came from, I guess it was Zahner that really started pushing this idea seriously and checking it, which is to say that it seems that you can always take a group, a certain group, namely a, a finite Heisenberg group, which generalizes what I wrote for the dimension two case before. And you can always find a single vector that people now just call a fiducial vector for, I mean, makes sense, but that's just become kind of the definition, I guess. It's sort of some technical jargon, but it's just a vector whose orbit gives you a set of equiangular lines or, you know, sig PLVM or whatever you want to call it. So what is this finite Heisenberg group? Well, it's, you know, it's a group generated by say two matrices, X and Z that look like this, where this zeta D is a primitive Dth root of unity. Okay, so like E to the two pi I over D. Um, and this one here is like a cyclic shift. This one here is kind of like a clock, right? It's applying a different phase on each basis vector. And, um, and, and these matrices, they almost commute like up to, up to a phase basically. So you get a projective representation of ZD cross ZD on like, you know, projective space um, from these matrices. So in other words, you have a commutative group, ZD cross ZD that's acting on projective space, but by non-commutative matrices, right? Where we just, but we don't care about the phase because we're just looking at lines, right? So to be a little more explicit, I mean, we can just fix a concrete like, like projective representation by mapping you know, the vector J to say this operator here. Okay. And then you have some nice properties where they're kind of like, if I take the dagger, it's like I put a minus down here and, um, and you even have a nice description of the co-cycle, the two co-cycle that um, shows up in the projective representation. Okay, so, so Zahner conjectured that these things exist for all D, that there's a sec POVM for all D. And sometimes people call this, his weak conjecture and compared to a strong conjecture, which says that, um, you know, these fiducial vectors exist for all these. So not just sig PLVM, but actually, you know, that there's a fiducial vector whose orbit under this finite Heisenberg group gives you a sig PLVM. And actually it turns out that every single example of a sig PLVM or type two design that we know has this form. And the only one that doesn't have this form is, is Hogger's set of 64 lines from a quaternionic polytope, um, which, which exists in dimension eight. But still those are another finite Heisenberg group. It's like a, you know, it, it's one that's an extension of like Z2 to the six instead of like Z2 squared in dimension two. So there's some sort of a three qubit Heisenberg group that shows up in that case. But everything else, is coming from this, this other form. Okay, so, well, that is, except for dimension, well, no, I'll leave it at that. So dimension three, I can now tell you some other explicit examples that are very easy to describe. Namely, okay, so this is some quantum notation by this 
ket zero, I just mean the vector like one zero, I mean like, like uh, the vector one zero zero. And this two would be the second or the third basis vector if I label them by zero, one, and two. So this would be like zero, zero, one. Okay, so in other words, the vector one, zero, e to the i theta, that thing for all theta winds up being a fiducial vector. And um, you can kind of take orbits of that under the Heisenberg group or more generally, I guess, under, the, uh, under its normalizer, which I'll say more about in some slides. And that gives you all the ones in dimension three. So there's some continuous family in dimension three, as opposed to dimension two, where there was a discrete set of only eight solutions, okay? Um, not so exciting. What about dimension uh, seven? Okay, so this one, I just love this example. So we have this very concrete way of writing a solution that was really already found in the past by Appleby and Scott and Grossel. I mean, there's only finitely many is kind of the, the upshot, which I'll say in a bit, we can't prove this. So um, people have constructed all the ones that you can possibly construct in every reasonable dimension that's around. So, but this one was sort of found by hand by Appleby and then by a computer algorithm by Scott and Grossel. And I managed to massage it into this extremely nice form. And so what are we looking at here? So this here is the Legendre symbol. It's, uh, it's a one if J is a quadratic residue mod seven and a minus one if it's not, okay? And a zero if J is zero. So I, I just mean this is this length seven vector, right? So like one is a square mod seven, two is a square mod seven, three is not a square mod seven. That's what these ones minus ones mean. And um, so if I can just write out this vector here in terms of, uh, again, like the, these are just basis vectors, zero. Uh, you know, this guy here is this vector plus or minus. And basically you just have this nice algebraic number here. And by this, I really just mean taking it or it's inverse. And um, so we've got this beautiful solution where the entries are algebraic numbers. And so meaning that they all live in this particular number field. So namely for this vector, they just live in the, this number field where I ignore the seventh roots of unity. But then if you take the whole, you know, the, the whole orbit under this Heisenberg group, it's got these roots of unity in it. So kind of the whole set is going to be defined over this number field here. Um, hey, John, in this, yeah. in this uh, expression with the sum there, you don't have any kets. Is there oh, yeah, there should be a ket j there. Thanks. Ket j, okay, that's what I thought. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I, I won't live do it because it'll make that disappear. But for, can you remind me later, Sam, to add that? Because I've probably, I've probably forgotten to add that in other talks. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so there should be a ket j there. Thanks, Sam. Um, all right, so... What's neat about this and what really is kind of pointing to the huge can of worms involved in this problem is that this little number field here, which is not so bad of a thing to play with, it has a non-abelian Galois group. So, so what's meant by that? Um, let me move on. I'm realizing that my clock is blocked. Why don't you, oh, I got it here. Okay, good. About a half hour in, nice. Okay, so let me just give some definitions now. So what's an algebraic number? Uh, algebraic numbers are the kind of things that if you're, if, you know, if you're using Mathematica and you're excited that it's gonna solve your problem for you, you have it solve some equations and it spits out some horrendous looking expression like this. And you say, oh God, what have I, do? what have I done? Right, but this is really not such a bad data structure to have around if you, if you uh, dig deeper. because. What it is, is it's some sort of a way of telling you, of describing a number exactly, okay? It's, 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 it's giving you some exact representation of a certain number, namely of, of a certain solution to this polynomial, right? So here you've got, for example, some degree, say 10 polynomial, and it has, you know, 10 roots with multiplicity, and this, this thing needs to take the second root, okay? And, you know, computers love numbers like this because they don't make any mistakes working with them. And so, if you conjecture that something holds and that something equals, equals something else and you plug in algebraic numbers and you show that they're equal, then they're really equal and this constitutes a proof as opposed to just knowing that there's some tiny epsilon and maybe you need to prove some bounds in order to infer a proof. So that said, just to give some, some, some math to this. So say like, like a number, so a number we say it's algebraic if it's the root of some integer polynomial like this f of x, 
okay? And it's easy to show that if a number is algebraic, then, you know, if two numbers are algebraic, then their sum is algebraic, their difference, their product. And if, you know, if, if one of them is non-zero, you can divide by it, you get another algebraic number. And um, to give some examples, so I, the square root of minus one is an algebraic number. And uh, probably one of the first non-trivial algebraic numbers people meet. Okay, this satisfies f of i equals minus one for the function x squared plus one. Okay, maybe another one, let's say square root of two, another famous algebraic number, I guess, discovered far earlier than this, than i. Okay, um, this is the root of this polynomial, x squared minus two. Okay, um, another algebraic number we've seen in this talk already is a cyclotomic number, the dth primitive root of unity. This is the root of this polynomial, okay, x to the d minus one. Okay, so these are some nice algebraic numbers that, 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 that we meet in life. Um, but algebraic numbers by themselves are not so exciting. What's nice is that they kind of, they have lots of friends and they live together in vector spaces called number fields with these friends. And so, um, you know, if I take arithmetic with algebraic numbers, okay, these give me, these give me new algebraic numbers. And it turns out that um, that you stay within the you know this this vector space or or or, or field of of algebraic numbers when you when, or the one you started in. So to say that again, say if I if you you tell me a pile of algebraic numbers, I can just start taking polynomials in those numbers with rational coefficients, and this gives me something called a number field. Okay, this thing's going to have finite dimension, and um, over Q that is, and um, they're all going to be, you know, you'll get all polynomials in these alphas with rational coefficients. So, so for example, if I take this i, square root of minus one, the number field it generates is the, the field of Gaussian numbers. Okay, so it's some two-dimensional complex, some two-dimensional rational vector space, but it's a, but it's a discrete subset of a one-dimensional complex vector space. That's the thing to keep in mind, right? So it's just, you're taking specific algebraic numbers. It's actually a dense subset, really. Um, similarly, if I take, say, square root of five, and I take all polynomials in that, I get a real quadratic number field. And if I was to take, uh, you know, all polynomials in a, in a cyclotomic number, or in the root of unity, I get a cyclotomic number field, the dth cyclotomic number field, okay? So, um, so those are number fields. Going a bit farther, uh, we can talk about a notion of a normal extension. So basically, if, you, if you've got a number field, and if these alphas are all the roots of some polynomial. Okay, so they're not just some random one. It's really like you took a polynomial, you calculated all the roots, and those are the ones you gave me. I start producing polynomials in those. I generate some number field that has a nice property that, well, okay, I guess I'm being a bit more general here. So let's say K is a number field I'm starting with. And now I'm gonna take polynomials with coefficients in K, okay? Not just coefficients in the rationals, but with coefficients in, in this number field K. Um, and um, if these guys then generate, um, you know, so if these are all the roots of that polynomial, they're gonna generate a number field that's called normal or Galois over this base field K. Okay, it's called the base field. And in these cases, so when you have such a normal extension of a number field, then that means that, th that the group of all automorphisms of that number field that fix the base field K ele element wise, is known as its Galois group. And it has this, this great feature here, which is that the order of the Galois group, there should be a slash there. Um, the order of this Galois group is actually equal to what, what's called the degree over K, which really means the dimension as a vector space over, over K of F. Okay, so if the dimension of the vector space F over K equals the order of this group, that's exactly when you're in this scenario where you have a normal or a Galois extension. And then we don't write ought anymore, then we write gal, just to remind you that it's a, it's a normal extension. Um, so just to give some examples, that was kind of a mouth, you know, mouthful. But uh, if we take the complex numbers, okay, the Galois group of that over the reals is generated by the complex conjugation automorphism. And this group is just Z2, okay, complex conjugate, or you don't. Okay, another Z2 extension of, say, the rationals now is actually this Q root 5. And it's generated by the automorphism that takes root 5 
to minus root five, okay? Now for the cyclotomic field, we take the field generated by the root of, you know, the dth root of unity and it's Galois group over Q. It turns out this is Galois or normal. It's just generated by these automorphisms. Take zeta D to zeta D to the A for any A that's relatively prime to D, okay? Or in other words, for any A that's invertible mod D, it's in the group of units, okay? And so this, is, this just gives you your Galois group in the cyclotomic case. Okay, so in the sense, like if, if you, you know, so, so this Galois group kind of reflects like some, it's parameterizing the ambiguity in what you mean by the solution to a polynomial equation. Or if for the physicists, if there's any physicists in the audience, it's kind of like a gauge group of your number field, right? It's telling you, like, as far as the computer is concerned, it doesn't know which solution is one versus the other. It's not picking an embedding, you know, the complex numbers, although you might have one in mind. Um, just from the abstract algebra sense, this thing is parameterizing our, uh, <clears throat> you know, the symmetries of the number field that fix the base field, okay? Um, okay, so that said, I now want to say, go, you know, go back to our problem. Why am I telling you all this stuff? Okay, so what about proofs of strong zoner? Okay, so when can we prove this? So proofs of strong zoner exist anywhere that people have explicitly constructed these things and it can prove that the overlaps are what they are. And so when I last made these slides, which was by now some time ago, um, maybe a year or two ago, this was what was proven. And I think people, especially you know, Marcus, uh, Marcus Appleby really leads the, uh, the charge on this. But I think, I know that Marcus and Steve, and I, and I think also uh, Gene Kopp was mentioned down here, have been computing stuff. So they maybe have more than this, but last I heard, this is what we had proved. Um, we also have numerical and exact fiducials for, for like many, many, many more. And I think people, again, are still running the numbers on this. And just, you look for one, you find one. Pick a random dimension, you uh, pick a random vector and just minimize, you'll find it. But you can't somehow, you still have to like round it off into a number field in order to prove that you really have like the minimum of like a frame potential or something like that. Um, so yeah, so we have these explicit constructions because they do live in specific number fields like the ones I've described before. And one of the things that makes it hard is that these are not just, like like number fields like the ones on the other slide they're humongous and like of and i say like degrees into the tens of thousands just for the ones i put on this slide i mean really the degree is unbounded and it tends to grow like at least quadratically with the dimension so already you know you should expect that this is going to get ridiculous pretty soon as you start to compute these things so what number fields so now i can throw out some conjectures so many years ago, I guess I say many, maybe this is nine years ago, Appleby, Appleby, Zahner. Uh, this is the only paper Zahner ever, well, Zahner wrote a PhD thesis on this some time ago, maybe 20 years ago, where he made these conjectures. And I think pretty much the only paper he really was on in this, in this area was with Marcus Appleby and Appleby's wife as well, um, whose name I forget. Um, but so they conjectured actually that these number fields are all abelian extensions of some real quadratic number field. And so when I say abelian extension, I mean basically that this gal FQ is some abelian group, okay? So they conjecture that you start with, you take your dimension D, you compute this, you take your dimension D, you compute this number, take the square root, adjoin that to Q, you get some quadratic number field. But then now you take some polynomials with, uh, you know, coefficients in this field and you generate some new bigger number field whose Galois group over K is abelian. And they conjectured that, the Gal that every fiducial is defined over such a field. And this was basically by taking explicit solutions and using something like, like magma and or gap to like actually um, tell you what the fields are. And actually, I can show you some of this data later in the in the talk. Actually, it was it was really from this. There was a Scott Grossel paper from two thousand nine, that was the first to actually really compute, like to use a computer to do this kind of a study, and that's where they listed like all these Galois groups, which then Appleby Appleby Zana then had had a specific conjecture for what the quadratic number field should be. It was actually apparent from the other work 
that it should be a quadratic, it should be a, a abelian extension of some quadratic number field, but these specific ones came out of the AAZ conjecture. And more recently, in a paper with Appleby, uh, Steve Flamia, and Gary McConnell, we, um, we, we put forth a much more refined conjecture, which says that actually you can always find a solution over a number field called the Ray class field of this K with conductor D prime infinity, where D prime is, well, let's just call it D, but D prime is gonna be 2D if D is even. And just to compare, I'll tell you that if this K was Q, then this field I've described to you is the, is the D prime uh, cyclotomic field. Okay, so this thing will contain that cyclotomic field, but it's strictly bigger in general. Um, and actually, uh, a guy by the name of Gene Kopp in his PhD thesis and in some subsequent papers refined this conjecture a bit more to give an ansatz for uh, what all the fields should be. And they involve something that either is or ought to be called a ring, a ring ray class field. And I won't say probably too much more about the specifics of how these ray class fields are defined, but I have slides on it. And maybe in the after section, I can tell you guys more because surely I will run out of time before I get to that. But, um, okay, so, so that's these conjectures, but maybe we take a step back and we can ask, well, like, how do you solve for these things? And so I can give a very concrete description for how to characterize these fiducial vectors, which really works beyond even, so beyond even the complex projective case. So namely, let's say I have you know, a group acting on complex projective space or really on any space. Um, then it turns out that well, let's say any space where we can talk about T designs. So at least the crosses, but any you know, association schemes probably work for. So we'll say that the orbit of some point, uh, so, so yeah, so the orbit of a point in our space is a T design. If and only if that point is a common zero of all the invariant harmonic functions up to degree T. Okay, so you take all these harmonics, except for the degree zero, right? And, and the idea behind this, right, is that like what you want T designs to do is to simulate averaging over the whole space, right? So basically, um, maybe I should have said this at the beginning, right? So, so the idea is that like the degree zero stuff is just the constant functions. So when you average, you're really just trying to project everything out that's non-constant. So T design is kind of the next best thing. It's saying, well, you really only need to project out some of the stuff, okay? So, I mean, so it's like Sobolov wrote this nice paper back in the 60s, it's like two or three pages, where he does this for the sphere. And he characterizes, like, I should have put this in the slide, but I didn't. It's a nice picture from his talk where he, uh, or from his, from his paper, where he says for all the different, like, so he takes G to be all the different uh, finite subgroups. So like the icosahedral group and whatnot. And he says exactly, like, if you take a certain point, take the orbit, like, I guess for some of these groups, any point gives you a certain strength design, and then some points give you a slightly higher one, right? Because the upshot is that like G, maybe maybe there's no G invariance is the upshot, and maybe there's more. So um, so basically like what happens for the T designs or, or for these complex projective two designs is that if you let this G be ZD cross ZD, right? Then it turns out that harm one is zero. And, uh, harm two has all the interesting stuff in it. And uh, you can actually calculate some dimensions of these things too, if you like. Um, you should notice that this number here looks kind of familiar, right? But it's not that number. You have to switch the plus and the minus, okay? Um, yeah. So now I get to the good stuff. So there's equations these things, it gives us explicit equations. And actually, if I was more diligent, I would have actually said that if I ignore this last chunk here, okay, this stuff here spans harm two, or sorry, Paul two. So this here is, uh, I should take that back. What I should say is that this stuff here minus this correction term is spanning the G invariance in harm two, where G is ZD cross ZD, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm taking all the G invariants in, uh, okay, you know, I said this wrong, I'll say it one more time. I'll say that this stuff spans the G invariants in Paul two, 
okay? And subtracting this stuff off is basically projecting out um, the constant part because there's no degree one invariance, it turns out. So harm one G is zero, one can show. Harm zero is just constants and harm two G um, or harm, you know, the, is exactly this space here, okay? So um, maybe I should say exactly this space here because okay? so there's a subtlety, which is to say that, um, Remember back in the beginning when I talked about these polynomials and Zs and Z bars, I said, you know, we're gonna let them be independent variables. You should think of Z bar as the complex conjugate, namely here where I'm plugging it in explicitly is, is, is what I mean by thinking of it as such. But algebraically, you wanna keep it as an independent variable, right? So you might say there's a folklore conjecture, which is just because um, everybody kind of knows from looking at all the data that there's just finitely many solutions in a given dimension. So the solutions seem to be isolated. Okay, so, um, and um, yeah, so in, so in a sense, you have some kind of like a real algebraic variety due to this condition here from the complex conjugation. Okay, but we'd like to be a bit more explicit about this kind of statement. So here's a, a little better conjecture that I can, that I can say, and I, I think others have said similar things as well. Um, basically, let's drop this condition on the uh, complex conjugation. And now we just consider a complex projective subvariety. Okay, where I'm gonna ignore that. Um, it turns out that this thing is also zero dimensional. So, so it seems, and it's in red because it's not proven. Okay, but if, if, uh, if D is three, it's actually one dimensional, some one D family. And uh, this is something that I can claim I've actually checked explicitly in magma, like as in I fed it all the equations and I said, please tell me what are all the points of this projective scheme. And it says, you know, here's a list of the finite number of them, or compute the dimension of this thing, and it can compute the dimension and so on. So, you know, magma verified using some algorithm for finding Grobner, Grobner bases um, that this thing is zero dimensional as well. And so, kind of putting this all together with some kind of technical details that I'm certainly leaving out, having to do with like, like the sort of machinery that one uses to actually analyze zero dimensional varieties to find over the rationals or the integers actually. Um, what one can show is that when it's zero dimensional, the points have friends in the sense that, uh, that, that, that they're combined, that, that they live in number fields. And there's and there's and they're going to be organized into Galois orbits, okay, in, in the exact kind, in the exact same kind that I mentioned earlier. And if you kind of take these and partition them according to those orbits, you know, each orbit winds up being a um, you know an orbit of the Galois group of some extension of this of that certain ray class field extension of this field that's relevant. But that thing's got a non-abelian Galois group, which means that half of the uh, automorphisms don't commute. With complex conjugation, or at least that's what it means in this setting. And those are the ones that screw up your norm. Okay, so so they screw up the inner product property and everything. So we don't care about those ones. But if we just keep the ones that commute with complex conjugation, then those are the ones that are the automorphisms that fix K, I should say, instead of taking the entire field. And um, one can kind of infer from that that there must exist solutions over this quadratic field that define these things directly in the complex projective space. And while I hoped and dreamt of being able to describe those equations for you in this talk, that's still ongoing work. Um, so let's see, how am I doing on time? I've got four minutes, okay. So I can say a bit about, um, so here's some neat stuff on quadratic forms on matrices. Uh, but maybe I will skip that because it's not directly relevant, but I can say that this magical number seems to be showing up not so much as the dimension of a space of harmonic functions, but a space of what I might call harmonic minors. So like, like distinguished two by two minors that one can interpret as being used to enforce a rank one constraint amongst operators. But I wanna say a bit more about like kind of getting to the really good stuff. Um, there's this beautiful group of symmetries of the Heisenberg group um, that's described by something in mathematics called the Weyer representation. Okay, and what this is, is you take the group of all automorphisms of the Heisenberg group 
that fix the center. And these are the things that actually um, are representable by conjugation by matrices, i.e. Um, by they, that you get a, um, a natural projective representation of this group of automorphisms. And it's studied to death in number theory. In quantum information theory, people call it generalized Clifford groups without knowing the origin in number theory necessarily. But uh, the upshot is that this group lives inside of a, uh, you know, an extension of groups, which is either a semi-direct plot product or closely related to it. That's all I'll say in this setting here. Um, so the Scott Grossel data, I stared at these numbers more than I care to admit many years ago. Um, and there's just, just this beautiful data about solutions, okay? And the upshot here is that this S here is the order of a certain symmetry group that generalizes that, group, that order three group of symmetries I mentioned at the beginning. And this is about their numerical solutions, not the exact solutions that they found over number fields. So they couldn't possibly know about algebraic solutions in this case, but they could know about the unitary solutions that come from this group here, this ought CH, okay? And that's what these, these S's here in, in this field. And notice everything is divisible by three. All those numbers divisible by three, and most of them are three. Okay. Um, so yeah, so from the exact solutions, there's actually much more structure that can and was inferred, um, such as like, I guess this was the whole list before, but there must be more known now. Um, so so why, the, you know, why these ones? Well, why were these the ones that we've been tacking on or people were tacking on? Well, if you look at the stabilizers, you'll notice that like the ones with bigger stabilizers were found first. And in a sense, that's because a bigger order, you know, it basically corresponds for reasons we can't fully explain yet to a larger group of algebraic symmetries, which then implies that the degree of this huge number field is not so big. So it's kind of lower hanging fruit to be like computed exactly. And so just to say a bit about what this is. So, okay, so let's say D is a number that's zero or one mod four. So I'm sorry that I'm now at exactly 50 minutes. So. Um, should I wrap up and say more about this after the fact? No, you've, got a couple, you've got a couple, you, you've lost some time at the start. Nobody's going to mind a couple minutes. Okay, okay, good. Thanks. So, so yeah, so let's, so suppose D is some integer. It's zero or one mod four. Okay, so going all the way back to like, you know, Gauss's magnum opus when he was 19, people have analyzed these kinds of numbers, you know, uh, and um, one can show that you can write D as some, as a square of some integer times some D zero, where this D zero is not of such a form, or where F has to be one of such a form. And D zero is called a fundamental discriminant. And um, basically, um, let's see here. If you then take the ring generated by this number here, this D plus root D over two, this is something known as a quadratic order, and it lives inside of uh, this quadratic number field. And actually, if you were to take D being D zero, it gives you what's called the maximal order or the ring of integers. But otherwise, it's giving you some finite index sub ring called just the quadratic order in general. And um, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between you know, such numbers and such orders, okay? And so it turns out that if you take this capital D equal to this magic number here, then Basically, to each fiducial in dimension D, the symmetries of that fiducial are governed exactly by the arithmetic of a quadratic order that lies between um, the maximal order here and this kind of minimal one here. Um, and I should say that um, the first person to write down this explicit notion of going, so this is where this Gene Kopp was the one that really wrote this down explicitly in his PhD thesis. Um, essentially, it turns out that this minimal order here has a, it has a unit that has order exactly three and no higher, but the other ones have larger, larger order units. Uh, exactly order three mod D, I should say. Um, but to say a bit more here, okay, so I'm just going to focus on this case here of the, of the maximal order. Okay, so let, let U plus, okay, you know what, actually, let me just tell you a bit more background and then I'll come back to that. 
So I told you about algebraic numbers. There's algebraic integers, which generalize the relationship between the ordinary integers and the ordinary rationals. Okay. And so if I take like the Gaussian numbers, the Gaussian integers actually form a discrete lattice. Okay. Which is just like the integer combinations of, of, of one and I. Okay. On the other hand, if I take these real quadratic integers, I now get some kind of a discrete lattice generated by you know one and the golden mean, which actually generates the maximal order there. Sorry, which generates the maximal order there. But now this thing is like a dense subgroup of R. But if you kind of embedded R, you know, but if you embedded it into R2 using both embeddings, then you see it looks like a lattice. And similarly, you can do the same thing for the cyclotomic numbers. And for all these examples I gave, the, the algebraic integers are basically what you think they should be mod kind of this notion of like this factor of two or something. More generally, it's a much harder problem to compute a maximal order. And I think in it, maybe it's even like NP hard or, or worse or something like that. Um, but in these cases, it's easy. Okay, so there's a notion of invertible algebraic integers, which just takes, it's just the unit group of that ring. So it's all the algebraic integers with, 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 a, with an, with an inverse or whose inverse is also an algebraic integer. So for example, the unit group in the ordinary integers is uh, just plus minus one, okay? The unit group in, Z, in ZI has these four elements. And in the cyclotomic you, you know, integers, it's like it, it, the unit group is just these guys, okay? So it's just the roots of unity plus minus, you might need to add in minuses. But notice these guys are all finite, but something really weird happens in the case for, uh, you know, well, in general, but it starts happening in this case where you, you, where you have the, you know, the unit group of the ring of integers of a real quadratic field can now become, in, can become infinite, right? Because you, you can take this guy here, the golden mean, and you just keep hitting it with higher, higher, or lower, lower powers, and it just goes on forever. And you got a plus minus one also. So there's a, there's a Z2 there. But that doesn't happen up here. And, the reason for that is that basically there's a quadratic form defined in the case of a uh, quadratic number field. And you're asking for the ones that sit on the, you know, that, that thing defines, uh, you know, if you take everything of length one with respect to that quadratic form, in the case of imaginary quadratics, it's a definite quadratic form. So you get a circle. And actually the, the intersection of the circle with this lattice is just these four points. But in the case of the real quadratics, you now get some kind of like a hyperboloid and it has infinitely many points on it. And that is the reason that this problem is hard. So going back to it, what do we have here? Well, we have now let U plus generate the totally positive units in that ring of integers. Okay, so this would be like the golden ratio or maybe the golden ratio squared. Um, just the golden ratio, I think, in, in, in that particular case. Um, and then now let's, it then turns out that there exists an R such that I can write the dimension as U plus to the R plus U plus to the minus R plus one. So by totally positive units, I mean, these are the units that stay positive if you take a Galois conjugate. Okay, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's the generator of the units. Sometimes you have to square it. And um, it turns out that, um, that the order of that stabilizer subgroup actually equals the order of the fundamental unit, which is either this or the square root mod D, which is gonna be three times this R, which is this R. And furthermore, if that fundamental unit was already totally positive, which means that the narrow class number of this number field is equal to the class number, um, then actually that means that each fiducial is stabilized by some anti-unitary operator as well. And so this is just an observation, but it's, it's, a, it, it's impossible not to be true, just given the amount of overwhelming evidence we have for it. So yeah, so this, so, so this is the paper that with these guys, we, we described how this is all working. And I think this was published online maybe about a year or so ago, um, but we first posted it some years before that. It's kind of restating the stuff I said before, I guess. Um, and this gives us like a precise ansatz for the, for the relevant number fields um, for all these solutions, okay? So now we'd like to use this to prove existence for all D or at least infinitely many. Um, 
another, so I promised open questions. Uh, I didn't say as much about this as I'd like, but I can say that Gene Cobb has been exploring this in his recent papers. And it turns out that uh, there's a deep connection to yet another famous conjecture um, in number theory. So Harold Stark wrote some papers in the 70s where he conjectured that certain algebraic numbers that come from evaluating certain analytic functions associated to number fields ought to give generators for these number fields. And um, I should also just mention that these specific number fields, these Ray class fields, this goes all the way back to Hilbert over a hundred years ago asking, can you find them in nature? Are there some analytic functions I can evaluate that give me those numbers? So Stark has an ansatz, but it's still not proved. And of course they're the exact same numbers that show up in this problem. And when I say exact, I mean, they're like the, the overlaps in the sense that if I take these projections and I write them in the basis of these Heisenberg group operators, it's exactly those numbers. And I could say more about this later if you like, but I should maybe start to try to wrap up and say like, you know, how, are we, how am I trying to prove this? Well, first thing we can try to make our lives easier, maybe make D an odd prime. Then this generalized Cl Clifford group becomes a lot simpler. You can analyze it using the representation theory of SL2P, which is a little easier to describe. Um, there winds up being some difference between if the dimension is like one or two mod three in that case. Um, when it's one mod three, it turns out that um, you can even simplify the number theory further in some cases where it's possible for the class number of this base field to equal one. It turns out that never happens in the other case. And I haven't quite proved that. Um, and there's a sequence of solutions where there should always be a real fiducial and it pushes up into some pretty high dimensions. And I bold face this one here because uh, there's a huge symmetry group that should make it amenable to computation. And uh, I'll just say, stay tuned on that one. Um, Andrew Scott has conjectured actually that there should always be a real solution if the dimension has this form. Okay, this form, sorry, I keep pointing up here. If the dimension has this form. Um, actually, I said here, should be easy to prove infinitely many such primes. I take that back. I think it may be hard to prove that. Um, so with that, I will thank you for listening and maybe just wrap up with some other potential directions. I, I think that there may be some deep connection with the study of like how one can map tori into projective space via a harmonic map, which is to say a map that kind of uh, is a is a local that's like an extreme it's an extremum for uh, an energy functional. If you imagine trying to stretch a rubber torus or an inner tube into projective space in such a way that it's at a stable point. I, I have some data to map to back this up for the dimension three case where I can map it into in there with uh, analytic functions. But I think that it's the real analyticity of this problem that makes it uh, require something deeper. Uh, I used to wonder what it takes to solve this problem. Now I just think it's proving that this zero dimensional variety is non empty and proving that it's zero dimensional. And I was hoping I was gonna be able to tell you that for a fact, but you may have to wait until my next talk, which is gonna be the Tuck colloquium at the end of this month. And I hope I can pull it off by then. Um, one last thing I think that there's a connection to is the notion of minimal triangulations of projective spaces. And uh, if I had a whole other hour, I might've had pictures on here of a, of a great paper by uh, Kunal, which was, analog which was finding sort of discrete analogs of projective spaces. And there's a notion of, uh, maybe I can mention this in the discussion later, um, of you may look for a, a finite simplicial complex with the same topology type as a projective space. And it seems that um, you can do it for projective uh, planes, and there is a and and basically the dimension three or some of the dimension three sec POVM show up there also for real projectives, also for quaternionic projective and potentially for octonionic projective, um, and maybe I'll leave it at that. So thank you again for listening. Sorry for going over. Thanks, John.